Good job. In the big bill stack, we'll keep you in the know. In the big bill stack, we'll fix your techie woes and we'll break your trouble, make you feel we're all together raking and we'll raise a couple of grub down in the big bill stack. In the big bill stack, come and join our fire crew. In the big bill stack, we will show you what to do. And we'll hack it till we crack it and we'll tell the world about it and forget to tidy up. That's why it's now a bilge tank. Hello and Hello. welcome to episode 005 of the Bilge Tank. Hi, Paul, Bill, myself. Uh, this week we're going to start off with the news. This is a slightly new format. We're going to do a couple of different little segments and uh, we're going to start off with some stuff that we've seen this week that we really liked. Mm, snazzy. Nice, nice title <laughs> work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I saw this on uh, Hacker News earlier this week, and a guy who was talking about a micro web framework for the ESP8266. Um, the ESP8266 is the dirt cheap Wi-Fi kind of microcontroller platform that everyone's been talking about over the last year or so. Um, yeah, so some dudes in China just took a Wi-Fi chipset and kind of put a microcontroller with it and stuck it on a breakout board for next to no money, and somehow that's appealed to makers and hackers quite a lot. Yeah, the chips I think you can get kind of like two dollars. They're really, really cheap for yeah. for Wi-Fi support. They got pretty good range. Uh, the microcontroller is reasonably powerful. It's uh, ARM chip runs at 80, 80 megahertz um, and has a fair amount of storage and RAM to work with. So it's quite an attractive thing. Um, yeah, but this guy specifically, this was interesting because he's written like a, a micro framework for doing specifically RESTful HTTP stuff. Um, which means you can get up and running really quickly, and he's actually created a, a live web server, which I think he's only running for another day, um, that is serving requests uh, on the fly from an ESP8266 that's you know in his apartment or whatever. Um, and it looks really cool. Like the API that he's come up with is nice. Uh, it looks really simple to get started with. So I think it's definitely something we'll be looking at. Um, I have got some code examples, but we can't get them on street screen at the moment. So we'll put something in the description of this Later, yeah. video. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> After the fact. Definitely. <laughs> and probably the jingle's too loud. <laughs> the jingle is apparently too loud, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But everything else is okay. We're gonna have another another one of those later, we'll uh, we'll warn you in advance. We'll work on it again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Phil. GPIO zero. GPIO zero. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, Ben Nuttall and uh, Dave Jones, not that Dave Jones, but the one who created Pi Camera and things of that nature, have been working together on a kind of new GPIO abstraction, which you must have heard of by now, called GPIO Zero. Uh, that kind of takes the things we pioneered with uh, uh, Pybrella and Explorer Hat, the idea of taking uh, kind of all the GPO stuff and abstracting that away and making it really nice and simple and giving you just a very basic access for it. Just getting rid of the fluff. Getting really. rid of the fluff. Um, yeah. There's a lot of people who think that's a bad idea, but <coughs> unfortunately they're the people who it aren't aimed at, so it, it's not a problem. The, the basic idea of it is that if you get rid of all the fluff, you get rid of all the friction, then you can get kids and you can get teachers doing stuff with GPIO without having to teach them electronics in the process and get them on that first rung of the ladder. The thin end of the wedge, all the, the terminology that basically indicates you're trying to get people interested in something so that they'll then have that little spark and go, hmm, this is interesting, how does it work? How can I explore it further in, in more depth? And if you've got way too much code to write, way too much complexity to teach, and way too many lessons to learn before you even get to that point, then you've probably lost them before you even got anywhere. I suppose. Yep. So, I'm. Oh, I suppose. Traditionally, all, this is something that was done with RPI.GPIO. because this is a yeah, Python this, this API, right? So. It doesn't replace RPI GPIO. It builds on top of it. Mm -hmm and uh, gives kind of general users the, the ability to work with it in a way that is a much more meaningful and much more natural language and sensible to kind of the average user. Makes sense, you can guess what the next command will be if you want to do something. Yeah, quite. Yeah. So if you, in RPI GPO for example, one of the first things a lot of people would find themselves doing is at the top of the Python file writing a bunch of defines that would be all in uppercase and it would say something like 
LED underscore green equals 25. Which it's is essentially the, like mapping whatever hardware yeah, they're where talking to. Declaratively mapping your pin What's number to your LED, which is all well and good. But in uh, GPO0, that becomes implicit. So rather than declaring at the top of your file exactly what pin number corresponds to what LED, you say red underscore LED equals LED, and then in brackets the number of the pin that you want that LED to use. Yeah. So that you're at at the time you're setting up and declaring and creating your LED instance, you're also relating which LED is which to which pin number is which, which is, it works really nicely and is much more kind of understandable. So when you see that later in code or when you come back to it, you know immediately that at the point where that LED is being created and mapped to that pin number, exactly what's going on, or what needs to be connected to what, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is uh, something we've been doing kind of with Pybrella and with Explorer Hat all along, so great props to Ben for catching up with us. <laughs> Good on, mate. This is like a more generic approach, isn't it? Yeah. You, you, you still you tell it what's connected to where, and with our libraries, we always knew what was connected. Oh well, yeah, we, we knew said, yeah. this is what's connected. These are it's just objects. that simplicity. Well, I'm totally yeah. taking credit there for code I in no way wrote. Because <laughs> <laughs> I am Jupyter Zero's first customer. It's like, yeah, that's for me. The other, worse coder. the other nice thing is that every time uh, you see people working with RPI GPIO, is they'll they'll kind of run their program and it'll immediately say, "Oh, are you in BCM or numbered pin mode?" And then you go back in, you add this line of boilerplate that says, "I'm in BCM mode," and then you run it again and it says, "Oh, something's already attached to that pin." If you don't want to know about that, let's set warnings to false. So then you go back into your script <laughs> and you have a line that says set warnings to false, and you get all these like little bits of um, boilerplate code. And I think oh, uh, uh, GPIO zero is essentially opinionated. It decides yeah, it, how it's going to work and it just makes gives those you a decision straight away. I think the the pin numbering has been a bit of a weird one for a while because no one ever really cared about kind of sequential pin numbering or, or board pin numbering. The physical because it makes board, yeah. no sense. And well, you can count it. <laughs> who who wants you know, to physically, count? You know, physically, you know, really, really difficult. Yeah. We should have a challenge, a high-speed pin counting challenge. Well, before I think we lost a lot of kids to kind of, you know, Candy Crush Saga by just having to type those three lines of... Mm. <laughs> it's, it really is that. That's the battle we're fighting now for attention. So, yeah, good on with GPIO Zero. Yeah, it's, it's a good project. And yeah. it, it adds lots of nice functionality. So, like, if you tell it a pin's going to be an LED, you automatically yeah. get features like on, off, Oh, it does blink. some interesting things internally. Like, if you tell a pin it's going to be an LED, then it will store that pin number somewhere and remember it so that if you try and set that pin number to something else, it can give you a slightly friendlier warning. Oh, like an input or something. Saying that you've say, already oh, set this pin up as something else, don't try and set it up as an LED at all. Yep. Um, so we'll put the URL up for that and if you can try it out and give some feedback to Ben, uh, especially about it not working with Python 2. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh dear. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, it's it's uh, a really useful thing, and I think we'll probably end up modifying our stuff to either use it or. I work think more yeah, closely to try it, and so. to bring the two together. It, it, it already sense. has support for a number of boards, but at the moment it's very early. It's very prototypical. It doesn't have a lot of uh, device support in. So there's oh, so in principle it'll have a way of like import this board. And yeah. it'll set up all those mappings automatically for you for that product. It's so. not quite that simple. It's that it doesn't do it the way we do it is when you import a board, you get your object and everything set up and all ready to go for you. But mm -hmm. with um, GPO zero, it has a class that represents a board, and then that class will internally create uh, however many LEDs you need, however many buttons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you take that class and you create an instance of it, which. Um, just going to say it's a slightly odd approach because you can only ever have one instance of most boards attached to your pie at any one time. So, Yeah, because the hat spec only yeah. allows one hat. I'd have made it, as, like you say, a separate file that just sets everything up and you import it and it gives you the scope that you'd work with that board. Cool. cool. Right. Yep. So, if you want to ask us any questions, by the way, for the end of the show, um, get on chat now and start chatting us up. Hmm. So to speak. Hmm. Uh, yeah, we always like questions. We always like hard Definitely. questions. I think we've had a couple from Twitter, so we'll cover those later. Yeah, we'll pull those in. Yeah, so uh, that said. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is some new products. We've got a few exciting ones this week. Cover your ears! <laughs> new stuffs. Um, this is something we're not going to do every week, but when we've got stuff worth talking about, then uh, we're going to try and show them off a little bit. 
Um, right. We pulled out three things today. We've got, <laughs> of which I haven't brought one of them. Okay. Yeah. We've got Cobug. <laughs> Very exciting. These are finally Ooh. available. The Kickstarter units have all gone out. Uh, and I think we're one of the first shops to be stocking them in the UK, certainly. Yep. Um, Cobug is a great little platform for doing kind of wearable projects for kids. Uh, it's got a web-based IDE. Um, which makes it very easy to kind of write messages on the little 5x5 five five matrix and things on the front. Uh, you can power it from a coin cell, so it's great for making like badges, um, brilliant for kids getting started with programming and hardware really. Yep. Um, everything about it's well thought out, isn't it? I mean, And there are no problems with power circuitry. There are no, <laughs> no problems with the power circuitry. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, very cool. They've added, I, I wasn't aware of this, I don't know if that came in later, but there's like an extension port on it, which I believe they're calling Tails. <laughs> um, so that you can get plug-in boards to kind of augment the functionality by plugging them into the bottom of the code book. Um, but even the kind of the default features are pretty awesome, to be fair. So it's, it's a really nice little thing. So check it out. Uh, and the other thing we've got is a component kit, which is something we've we've stocked Arduino starter kits and things like that before. Yeah. Um, we've never stocked just a component kit without an Arduino. So obviously, it's a much cheaper way to get a range of good components. Um, this is one from Seed. It comes in a really nice little box to keep everything, um, but it's everything you'd expect, uh, kind of like servos, potentiometers, piezos, switches. A really handy box. Resistors. <laughs> the boxes are I great. I think it is we the box these. that yeah. is the reason why we're stocking this. More we have complete box yeah, lust. They're very pretty. We yeah. do. We do have box lust. Anyone can yeah. put components in a box, but only Seed can make this box. Yeah, and that's the difference. Um, so we really like that. It's 15 quid. You get a breadboard and uh, jumper wires and loads of little bits and pieces. So it's a great little starter to go with Arduino or Raspberry Pi, just to kind of start bulking out your collection of components. Okay, it's a good Christmas choice. Excellent wink, Christmas wink, choice. Being nudge, nudge. green yeah. and festive and all that. Uh, and the other thing we got in this week, which is kind of exciting, is the Anadies cases oh, for the Raspberry Pi. Um, and I think, you know, we already stocked quite a few cases, including our own. Um, but this is the only kind of milled aluminium one that we thought was good value for money. So, yeah, we brought those in. A lot of people black. like that. And, mm -hmm. it, and it's black. Uh, we've also got this silver version as well with a clear lid. Yeah. Um, but that's no, a nice thing. It feels Go with nice. this version. The, yeah. the lid on the top just reminds me of the classic kind of hi fi cabinet door kind of style. You can't see it at mm. all on camera, but it's, it's kind not of a quite brownie, black. It's sort of a brownie, thing, isn't it? beigey, mm. sepia hue mm, to no it. It's, it's nice. So you think maybe if you put a unicorn hat in there, that would show it up a lot more nicely? Ooh, well, we should have totally done that. Next time. <laughs> Next <laughs> time we put a unicorn hat in there. Yeah. That would be cool. Mm. Um, yeah, Phil, did you want to? Do something with the GPIO zero. Um, I have got a script set up, screen. but I don't know what will actually happen on the Pi screen if we try and do anything. Also, this script is running over an SSH session, which is uh, right. a little mm. convoluted. Yeah, we won't be able to see that on screen, will we? Can I don't we, think we can can switch to screen? Hmm? Let's exit this. Let's switch to screen. Okay. You got it, Phil. You're in control. Oh, right. I'm on uh, Raspbian Wheezy still, so I'm going to have to put sudo before everything, like a chump. Ah. So GPIO0 is simple as import GPIO0. A lot of people just import the specific things they want from GPIO0, so it could be from GPIO0 import LED, but I want everything because I'm a hungry. That's just how you roll. So I'm uh, going to look over and find the the buttons on here, which is 25 for the button, so we'll say button GPIO 0, button 25. So this is basically a one-liner that relates the number, the pin number, straight back to your object, which is a really nice, clear and simple way of seeing exactly what's going on, kind of when you come back and look at your code later. Uh, and it's much better than doing something like... Da -da -da -da, something like that, where you've got one line that has your define, and then you've got another line that sets it up as an output, and then another line that reads it and writes it. This way it's just button. So that gives us a button. Now for an LED we can say basically the same thing. And to make a button turn on LED, and this is a really nice succinct example, but probably not something you'd use terribly much in any real world code. You can say button, hold on. Let's refresh my memory of what we're looking at. Ah, here we go. Button when activated. And just tell it to turn the LED on. 
Why do you think they've gone for like activated and deactivated instead of pressed? It is strange. I think it's uh, a side effect of the attempt to be very generic, and right. it doesn't oh, make I too see. much sense because within <laughs> within button it's being aliased anyway. So there's a there's a class button that's actually explicitly aliasing the when deactivated and when activated um, methods from other methods, which have right. uh, so got yet yeah, other names, which uh, I can't remember what they're called, but they're something like. Oh, no. <laughs> right, we've got so a bit of a camera fail. Let's go on this. So I press enter. Hopefully, when I press that button, yay! Oh wow! Hey. Magic. Could it be any simpler? I suspect not. Fantastic. Cool. Okay, magically, while you were watching that command line, <laughs> that product appeared. With absolutely okay. no <laughs> banging of doors or <laughs> no, no, rustling no. or anything like that. Yep. Um, yeah, this product we're quite excited about because people were uh, really interested to see it, and it's a new lens set for the Pi camera. Um, we used to stock a single lens that was just a wide angle, um, but we found these uh, instead, which is a set of three, and it lets you do wide angle, fisheye, and macro um, shots, so with a different combination of lenses applied. Um, Sandy has written up a nice tutorial on the learning portal. Uh, describing how you use the different lenses in combination to take different types of photo. Um, but they're really nice, and it has a little clip, which lets you just attach that to the Raspberry Pi they camera. do some really fantastic macro shots, don't they, with the, the Pi camera, surprisingly. The macro, mm -hmm. from that, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, the quality <laughs> like a of the little macro shots. Microscope I mean, for eight quid or whatever, and it's like, that's a really... It's a bit easier than kind of loosening the glue on the lens as well to try and get macro. <laughs> <laughs> always a little yeah. bit dicey. That was a little bit dicey. Yeah. Okay, I think we've got a couple of questions. Um, right. One of which from James was asking. Oh, what did he ask? That's where I'm going to go. Well, we do have the one from Ragworm, don't we? We do have a question from Ragworm. Yes. How can UK manufacturers and designers better support the maker scene as a whole? Well, hmm. That's a, that's a that's kind of a big question. Uh, I think the main thing is flexibility, openness to trying new things, the maker market changes, how you play with hardware, what people expect from it. Uh, so I think Ragworm have been really helpful in that, as in they've been pretty much the only board house who've been open to trying these wild colours, like things we did with um, Flotilla. Flotilla. Yeah. yeah. And stuff like aluminium substrates and reasonably priced test panels. Mm. and stuff like that. Um, the main problem is that most places you go to are so kind of stuck in their ways of just doing tens of thousands of green PCBs every month. They just yeah. don't want to even try anything else. And that makes it really hard if you want to do something a bit different yeah. to even get past that kind of barrier of talking to someone who's prepared to give it a go. Yeah. Um, obviously, working with ragworms has been great because they'll experiment, they'll try things out, and they don't always work. And then we go back to the drawing board and try it again. Yeah. I think uh, kind of fast, cheap and reliable as well with prototyping services, mm -hmm. it's kind of pick any one or two. So we've mentioned before dirty PCBs, they are cheap and good, uh, ragworm are fast and good, and we have Euro circuits who are fairly cheap and good and fast if you don't want it to be cheap. Yeah, um, but they're online tools. Your circuits we like because they're online tools. <coughs> you upload your design and it will debug it for you now, even, and it will show you a visual of how it's going to look, which is great when you're trying to develop new things. And they do have pretty reasonable prices for their green PCBs. Uh, below that is uh, dirty PCBs who you chuck an eagle file at them, and then a couple of weeks later or whatever, your boards will turn up and they will be generally very nice. Yeah, having said that, dirty PCBs do do an expedited one, and it's not right. even expensive. Like yeah. for Euro circuits, on average, if we were doing five, ten pieces of something and waiting a week, it probably cost us seventy euros mm -hmm. um, or thereabouts. And it's not always the same; depends what you're doing. Um, yep. Dirty PCBs, it can be like twenty-five bucks. I mean, they're really, really cheap. Yeah, good um, as well, aren't they? Yeah, they're and good they do quality. colours that no, do some good colours and no extra charge. Yeah, red, red, black, green. Maybe a couple of others, but yeah, yeah. basically the same same price. Which Whereas is nice. Euro circuit, you want black, and suddenly the price kind of goes yeah through the roof like that. Um, um, James yeah. is asking uh, about mounting the Pi camera to the new Pi display. So obviously some some mechanism for using it like a webcam, I guess, like in the top of a laptop. Yeah, um, we've had a couple of people ask about this, 
So it's something we should do. Um, We're going to produce a revision for the frame. Uh, there are a few reasons for this. One, we want it to be rotatable so it can be upside or right side up, mm -hmm. upside down, right side up. Um, another is just to have a couple of bits of finesse in the design. Um, and another is that we're expecting some display units to come pre-assembled to us. Um, we're not sure when that'll happen or if it'll be consistent, mm -hmm. but we need it so you can build around a assembled display unit with the drive board on it. So we'll be updating that product to have version 1.1 or version 2. Um, when yeah, it'll happens. be a 1.1, won't it? 1 it's, only, it's minor tweaks just to, yeah. just to accommodate certain things. At the same time yeah. that, we could, we could probably include a couple of little holes so you could have a plate to mount your patent Pimeroni camera mount on top mm -hmm. of your display. So you can do kind of FaceTime things maybe, yeah. um, or have it pacing the other way. Um, yeah, we'll look into that because that's a really sensible suggestion. Basically, yeah, it's something yeah. where like the obvious solution would be to put a big lump at the top or something, but that's not really our way. We're not because most people wouldn't default. do it. Yeah. So it's it's finding a nice way to make it like an optional extra mm. and give you that mounting option without kind of compromising the the normal use, which wouldn't have a camera at the top. Yeah, um, so we'll have a look at that. Yeah, there will be solutions. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any other news? Any other questions? I think that was about it. Yeah. Okay. Right, in that case, we will see you next week for Bilge Tank 006. Whoa.